What a me, Mitigar God and Buttock. Hello, friends, it's good to see you. My name's Greg Sims, everyone knows me as Uncle Greg. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge one Duddock land. I would like to acknowledge elders, past and present. We don't own the land, the land owns us. We come from Mother Earth. We are the land. And the land we're upon today belongs to the Buttermatical tribe of the Duddock nation. Is that when we take our next step, just remember the ones that walked this sacred land before. Tiari Mara, Daraka Pemel. Kawi Mari up Pemel the Gara Riki Bobona. By name of Watanang. No Desi guy. Diana Gamari the other lung. The Gara Ringi Tiari, the Gara Ringi Nagami guy. Kuli winning Gunagal da Gunagal. Dala Lawi Mukakot Bala Nagami. This is a low in here, three Maguna Gal. Jammy Tiari in the Gara Ringi or the Jomana. Mediga Gara and Warak Nina Daraka Pemel. Dejerigo. In the language of our people, we welcome you to Dunnock Lands. Thank you and have a lovely day. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It is most wonderful that you are you are pursuing these walks around around the foreshores of Sydney Harbour. They are important. More important is their interpretation. But you also are setting a standard for good, healthy living by, the, you know, setting, setting uh, walking up as a lifestyle. So I'm pleased that you haven't forgotten about the upper reaches of, of Sydney Harbour. We are part of Sydney Harbour. We enjoy that with our local communities and we're willing to share that with the rest of Sydney. Thank you. Thank you. I have the honour, Your Lordship, that we know there is good country near us and it shall be settled and cultivated in early spring. And of course, I wrote that to Lord Sydney on my return from the head of the river. I concluded my notes by stating, had I seen the country near the head of the river, I might have been induced have made the principal settlement there. We understood it was the Baramadigal that were in this area, but unfortunately, we didn't make any contact at that time. By the time I got to my journal and I asked my officers the name of the clan in the area, what I heard, what I wrote, was Parramatta. And with the greatest of apology, I really should have called it Baramatica. Well, that's history. So it has changed a lot over time, but there is still fish. Um, there's even reports of bull sharks and all sorts of things coming up from Sydney into the river. So this represents sort of one of the main food sources for the indigenous people of the area. So Parramatta was a food bowl, um, you know, a place where the waters met, a place where some of the clans would meet in order to get this food, very rich source of food from the river. And the word Baramada, you know, if we loosely translate it, is the place where the eels lie down. Yeah, they didn't lie down against family, did they? <laughs> <laughs> so we see more conflict, you know, following the arrival of the Europeans down the river, we see more conflict. So they want to set up farms, you know, they're establishing this as an area for them to grow food, to be able to feed the new colony. By setting up their farms, they were removing the barramatical from their land. And it's important to remember that what we're talking about isn't just the past, because they are a living culture. So we've got Uncle Greg right here, who has all of that knowledge, all of those stories, who are so willing to share it, and so many others like him as well. And so we just need, you know, to respond to that to um, respect it and hopefully all move forward together as well. Uh, while we're now in what we call the, the government domain, uh, which was essentially set up as we see it today by Macquarie, but things like the gatehouse and, and other structures you'll see on your way have nothing to do with the colonial era. The, the gatehouse is an 1880s building. The structure we're standing on now is believed to be the oldest uh, European-made bridge uh, in Australia. A lot of bridges will claim they are, 
particularly in Tasmania, but they're just uh, spending $20 million on the park here, and a part of it is to restore this bridge that we're walking over now, uh, and it'll be the oldest um, stone constructed bridge in Australia. Somebody just asked me about the monument. The monument is to Lady Fitzroy, uh, who was uh, one of the uh, later governor's um, wives in the 1840s. Uh, they were running late for a function in the city. The governor decided to take the reins, came down the, down the hill uh, and overturned the carriage and hit the tree here and killed his aide-de-camp and, and his wife. Uh, and uh, the monument uh, there, that is the third tree um, that's been planted alongside the, um, the, the monument as we go along. But because Philip has to come up, it takes him eight hours to come up in, on, on the river and then he stays overnight so he builds a structure here for him to stay uh, overnight and he supervises the farm. The farm's in control of uh, Henry Dodds and Henry Dodds is a free settler who was the leading farm hand on uh, Philip's own farm uh, at Lyndhurst. Uh, and how is Philip connected? Next door to Philip's farm in, in, in Lyndhurst uh, is George Rose. George Rose is the Chancellor of the Exchequer or whatever he would have been called in those days. He financed the first fleet. It was also his property that King George III would visit for his holidays. Uh, and uh, people like Joseph Banks and all of these guys were in and out of that property all the time. It didn't hurt that Joseph Banks had said to King George III uh, in one of his correspondence there are three men I need you to fast track through the system. I want these three Navy um, commanders to be fast tracked. One of them is William Bly, who turned out to be one of the greatest navigators the world's known. I want Horatio Nelson and I want Arthur Phillip. And all of those guys emerged through the system as a result of just Banks saying, these are the three I want. His word uh, also, but for Philip to be known by Banks in the detail that he's known and, and, and champion or sponsored through uh, that channel indicates that he had very good connections on, on the way through. Let's go up the hill. What Philip learned from the settlement at Sydney Cove was that military personnel living in houses thought of themselves as independent citizens rather than subordinate soldiers. And soldiers who lived in huts among convicts inevitably made connections with infamous characters there. Controlled accommodation and discipline therefore loomed large in Philip's start over town at Parramatta. On this fresh face of kinder country, there would be no private buildings or de facto ownership, no crooked rows or hidden places, no refuges for near-do-wells. The government would contain control of land and buildings, all would be open and transparent. The plan laid out a broad street 200 feet wide leading up from the river's edge to a gentle rise, where Philip built his own house. An anonymous soldier riding home in the early years described Parramatta as Philip's country seat. He hit the mark for Philip was clearly creating an Antipodean version of the modern and fashionable English gentleman's estate, complete with neat rows of workers' huts leading up to the gates of Government House and farm fields beyond. It was an expression not just of order and modernity, but of rank and hierarchy, a means of surveillance and control that was also pleasing to the eyes of those in control. Governor Hunter replaced Philip's small cottage in 1799 with a substantial Georgian-style two-storey house. Between 1812 and 1818, Governor Lachlan Macquarie and his wife Elizabeth enlarged and modified Hunter's house. They also undertook extensive landscaping of the domain in the picturesque English landscape tradition. Along with the house, the roadways, structures, cultural plantings, river and boundaries all reflect the design influence of the Macquarie period as does the town of Parramatta. By 1790, there were 100 convicts working on the government farm at Parramatta under the supervision of Henry Dodd. Fruit trees were planted, cattle introduced, and crops of wheat, barley, maize and oats were being cultivated. Farming continued under a succession of governors up into the 1850s. Brisbane replaced Macquarie as governor in 1822. He had a bathhouse constructed to the west of old government house. Originally surrounded by rooms, it had a heated plunge pool and a domed roof surmounted by a couple of lantern. But there was extensive vandalisation of the structure after the domain became a public park in 1857, and by 1886 it had fallen into such disrepair the park trustees converted it into a pavilion. 
Built in 1904, the memorial just beyond the bathhouse recalls Australian participation in the African Boer War at a time when Australia was becoming increasingly Republican. The Boer War was the first military engagement where Australian troops were not part of the British Army. The New South Wales Lancers were the first Australian troops to arrive in South Africa in 1899 with 100 men, including several from Parramatta and surrounding districts. The New South Wales Lancers Barracks is still located in Parramatta. Governor Hunter granted George Salter, an ex-convict turned cattleman, 30 acres in 1796. Salter erected this cottage sometime between 1796 and 1800. In 1815, Salter's 30-acre grant and his two-room cottage were absorbed into Governor Macquarie's government domain and Salter was posted to the position of overseer of cattle in Hobart. The cottage became known as the Governor's Dairy and it's one of the oldest buildings in Australia, rare in that it is a working men's cottage rather than a stately house. Most of the cultivated lands and livestock were still in government hands when a sick Governor Philip sailed away in December 1792. His successors, Lieutenant Governors Gross and Patterson of the New South Wales Corps, wound back public farming and grazing, giving away some of the stock and taking some 600 acres out of production. By early 1793, five full years after settlement, there were still only about 67 settlers, mostly clustered on or near the Parramatta River. Farms and gardens under cultivation totaled less than 1,700 acres. Of the 3,470 acres granted to settlers, only 417 were actually cultivated. There was as yet no prospect of so few feeding so many. Then, in October 1793, James Roos, the great hope of the colonial project, sold his farm and stock at Parramatta to an officer, Surgeon John Harris, for £40. He had held Experiment Farm for less than two years. His neighbour sold up at the same time to another officer. Both men said they wanted to return to England, but neither actually left. Suddenly, early in 1794, they and 20 others requested grants on the banks of the Hawkesbury River at a place they called, with typical simplicity, the Green Hills. Acting Governor Gross agreed. He had little choice, for they were already there. Of course, the flip side to all this intoxicating taking of the land was that it was already occupied. Wherever settlers took the river and creek frontages, the fertile floodplains and the lagoons rich in fish, birds and edible plants, they were taking the areas most densely occupied by Aboriginal people, their richest food sources. Settlers successively occupied the lands of the Barramatical of Parramatta, the Burra of the Hawkesbury, and as they pushed north and south along the river, the dark and Jung and Mulgawi peoples too. In each area, Aboriginal people waged war in defence of their country, their sustenance and their women and children. By 1795 the situation had deteriorated and Hawkesbury was said to be in a state of open war. By 1799 it was under martial law, a frontier zone where reprisals and killings were permitted during military raids. It wasn't until the 7th of July 1805 that Aboriginal people were again allowed to return to Parramatta and Sydney. That week, they thronged the roads from the Hawkesbury, the Neopean and other districts to the south, converging on Parramatta, coming in to meet the Governor for reconciliation. So, so here we see the formation of the Parramatta River. We've got the Toongabby Creek coming in from the west and we've got Darling Mills Creek coming in from the north. When the two converge, uh, at this location you get the formation of the Parramatta River which is quite a deep waterhole as you can see and would have had significance for uh, the indigenous or, or Aboriginal people at the time. We've been here with uh, elders and uh, they definitely confirm that this would have been a site of significance for them as, as well as a natural uh, 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 feeding place, uh, a natural harvesting um, uh, area uh, for eel and fish and, and other uh, wildlife.